So hello, greetings and welcome. My name is Angus Winchester and I'm the Global Education Director for the numerous BCB shows around the world. I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'd like to welcome you all to another in our Monday education series where we'll be bringing you some of the high quality bar and hospitality education that the shows are renowned for, split between some of the highest rated sessions from last year's event and also some extra sessions selected from this year's submissions. Firstly though, some housekeeping. We are recording today's webinar and a link will be sent to you tomorrow. I always read this one and I'm studying it earlier and it makes no sense at all. If you're having difficulty hearing us today and are listening through your computer, please check the speaker volume is turned up or message us using the chat box. Of course, if you can't hear me, you won't be able to hear that either, but still. Uh, feel free, however, to ask questions through that same chat box. We'll be reviewing the questions and keeping them and Jackie's kindly agreed to do a fairly extensive Q&A session at the end when most of your questions will then be asked. And finally, of course, this year's show is, of course, cancelled due to COVID. But in October, we will be running and participating in a digital event with our sister shows around the world. So keep your eyes out for information about that moving forward. So this year has finally seen the public recognition of the immense difficulties faced by people of colour in nearly every aspect of society at nearly every level. It is perhaps finally starting to realise that things must change. But in this industry in particular, what does change look like and who's responsible for it? Our next speaker ran a version of this session last year addressing this very issue and question entitled Inclusion and How to Build a Longer Table. And if you know him, then you won't be surprised to know that he's already revised and updated his work extensively for this year to be even more cogent and impactful. But for those who don't know him, let me introduce Jackie Summers. Jackie's an acclaimed author, seasoned public speaker and serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Jack from Brooklyn Incorporated and the creator of the award-winning Sorrel Liqueur. A native New Yorker, he was recently, recently featured in Esquire magazine for being the only black person in America to hold a license to make liquor in 2012. Ranked among the world's 100 most influential bar industry figures by Drinks International in 2019, and named the 2019 award winner for the best food essay by the Association of Food Journalists, Summers has written for everyone from the James Beard Foundation to Plate, Wine Enthusiast, and Edible Brooklyn. Everyone else who knows him knows him to be a passionate advocate for people doing right and helping those who ask for help. He is a polymath, a paladin, and I would like to be able to call him a friend. So take it away, Jackie. Thank you so much, Angus. I hope everybody's well on your side of the world, sir. All good, thank you very much. So for those who do not know the details, I'll run through this as quickly as possible. 10 years ago, I had a cancer scare. My doctor told me I had a 95% chance of death and a 5% chance of paralysis if I lived. And I lived. The question after you go through that is, what do you want to do with your life? And the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world was hang out and day drink. I want to be around cool people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, talking about shit that matters, having good food and good drink, and I wanted to monetize it. And when I couldn't think of anybody that would pay me to day drink, I decided to launch a liquor brand. How hard could it be, I said. And I launched Sorel Liqueur. I perfected the shelf-stable version in my kitchen. I wrote the business plan. I secured the seed capital. I launched a micro distillery. And Sorel just did gangbusters in the market. 95 points ultimate sprints competition, five stars per pack alt, uh, five plus I'm indifferent. The New York Times called it, called it Christmas in a bottle. It could not have gotten a better critical and public reception. But what I did not know, and what I could not have known at the time, is when I got my license to make liquor in 2012, I was the only black person in America to hold that license. I was Tigger. I was the only one. Basically, what that means is every single time I walked into a restaurant or a bar, every time I sat with distributors, every time I taught a sales team, every time I met, with, every time I sat in a boardroom, it was more likely that the people I was encountering had encountered through a zoo lions or tigers or bears, hopefully on the other side of a cage. 
None of them had ever seen a black liquor brand owner before. So I decided that it was in my best interests and the best interests of my industry to start to teach anti-racism in the hospitality industry. And the interesting thing about teaching anti-racism is you have to teach people it's not enough to not be racist. You have to actively be anti-racist because we exist in a system that's predisposed to racism. And when I started to dig into the research, I thought to myself, I'm trying to teach people who don't think they're racist to be anti-racist, but I don't think of myself as sexist. Am I actually anti-sexist? And the answer was no. The answer was, like most men, I was born and raised in a culture of sexism and heteronormativity. And I had tons of work to do and things to unlearn. And the great part about that is, once you have that revelation, you get to see there's a whole spectrum of intersecting axes of privilege and oppression. Yeah, there are certain areas where I'm, where I'm oppressed, absolutely. But there are some areas where I'm also incredibly privileged. I'm an able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual male. There's tons of stuff that I can do, which <coughs> makes it my responsibility, my responsibility to assist anyone who's differently disadvantaged than myself. I believed, believed that the best way to get people to actually be more diverse was to teach them to build a longer table. And I spent the past three years working under the premise that if you had, then it made everyone's life better, including yours. If you extended your table to others with talents and abilities and the desire to work hard could have too. I walked people through the language of diversity and equity and inclusion. I explained it in great detail. Who's in the room? Who's trying to get into the room? Is everybody being heard? I made it a point to come with details, factual information that proved that marginalized people suffer proportionately to society. So, of course, in our industry, but of course, in the, hospital, in, in the hospital industry, marginalized people suffer disproportionately because that's how society works. Our, our industry is just a microcosm of society. I made it a point to show that there's a wage gap, that men absolutely make more money than women do. I made it a point to show that this isn't a question of altruism. You could be a horrible person who really likes money because it's been proven that if we diversify your boards, if you diversify your management structure, you will be more profitable. I made it a point to try to teach people that it was in their best interest to extend their tables to people of color, to women, to the disabled, to the, to the queer community. The result was something like this. It didn't have a whole lot of effect. It, I mean, don't get me wrong. The seminars were passionate and informative and well-received, but actual change, most of it looked like Lincoln sitting at the table, on one side of the table, by himself. And it was equally as likely for the black guy to be there as it was for the dog in the chef's hat to be there. It just, I wanted to believe it was impactful and it wasn't. And then COVID-19 happened and overturned all of those tables. And when all the tables got overturned and the industry in its whole got turned on its ass and everyone started to ask, how do we set this right? What is it gonna look like post COVID? How do we put things back the way they were? My first thought was, why should I? 
why should I help to reset a table that was designed to, in, to marginalize me? That's the important thing here to remember is it isn't an accident that there are almost no black brand owners. It isn't an accident that there are so few black bar owners. It isn't an accident that there are so many marginalized people who are trying to get a seat at the table. The table was never designed for you. It was never designed for you. And that is not because you lack the skill or the volition or the integrity. It has been proven that a black man taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. So we've had that skill. It has been proven that black people started cocktail culture. This is a David Wondrich article. And his, his theory is very simple. The link is at the bottom, but, but the basic principle is food culture in this country came out of the antebellum South the people who weren't making their own food, they weren't mixing their own drinks either. It has been proven that not just cocktail culture, but dive bar culture also came from the black community. Why are so few people who are black, who are marginalized, owners of a culture that they contributed so much to? That is not a flaw, that is a feature. That is how that table has been designed to function. You are not meant to be included. And if you're waiting for a seat at that table, you are waiting for a bus that's already left the station. So it was devastating for me to realize that despite my best efforts and my impassioned pleas and my scientific data, I wasn't making a difference. But I had a Baldwin quote that smacked me in the face last year. Your slogan always hides your truth. Build along a table is a great slogan. It's a great slogan. It encourages inclusivity, it encourages diversity. It does not take into account the fact that that table was never ever designed for you. And now those tables are overturned. So should you try to help reset them? Should you wait for that train that, that the bus has already left the station? Or should you stop waiting and build your own damn table? It's never been a better time to have this particular conversation. I am a very big believer that if you do not own it, it owns you. I'm a big believer that ownership is the key to any kind of accumulative generational wealth. You can work for your whole life helping establish someone else's dreams. You can get out there and establish your own dreams yourself. With that in mind, we're going to examine three industry legends, just absolute legends, who've actually gone out there, started from nothing, built their own tables, built their own tables, and are, and are doing it right now. We're going to figure out why they did it, how they do it, and what we can learn from their examples. Let us take to begin the absolute goddess, Lynette, Lynette Marrero. I mean, Speed Rack, let's, let's, before, before we do that, before we talk about Speed Rack, just look at her credentials. Co-founder Speed Rack, bar director Lama, food and wine, top and fortune, top woman in food and drink, wine and through system mixology, of mixology of the year, Tales of the Cocktail Philanthropy speed, Award Speed Rack 2019, Tales of the Cocktail Best Mentor Award, Drinks International, most hungry and influential. Her, her credentials are unassailable, unassailable. 
he's not sitting at someone else's table. She is, for all of the incredible things she does, she is best known for co-founding Speed Rack with Ivy Mix, which is a platform which features women bartenders. The primary, the primary qualifying factor of Speed Rack is you have to be a woman. Because despite the fact that women, and you know, shout out here to, to Audrey Sanders and Julie Reiner, women are so deeply responsible for the cocktail revolution, and yet there are so few women owners because there weren't pathways to visibility. Ivy created a pathway for visibility for, for, for women bartenders. They didn't see a stage, so they created a competition that was only for women by women. They started off small and they went international. And it's, it's, it's easy to say the women who've done well in Speed Rack have not only built careers in it, but they've built lifelong relationships, lifelong relationships in this. It has been an absolute game changer to our industry. Obstacles you overcome, it all starts with money. It always starts with who's putting money behind your idea. They started where they were. Uh, Lynette used her credentials to talk to brands and to talk to friends. This is, a, this is something that's going to come back to us over and over again. But if you are starting from nothing, if you do not have family money, if you are not a person of wealth, and if you are not a person of means, you, are, you absolutely have a network. Tap your network, show your passion, show your ideas, show your ability to execute, and move the whole conversation forward. How did they grow the platform? This is a really tricky one because most of the liquor brands can afford to spend millions of dollars on a party and not think twice about it. Speedback has never had that option. It has always been an osmotic, natural, homegrown thing. So they used word of mouth. Again, your network is so important. Every person who participated in Speed Rack automatically became an ambassador. There were certain events in our industry, back when the industry had events and we could breathe on each other, that you could not miss. Pig and Punch, if you were at Tails, was an event you couldn't miss. If Speed Rack was in your city, you showed the fuck up. You showed the fuck up, you opened your wallet. And again, just, just so we can say this again, it was, more, it was more than just, maybe I, I missed this at the beginning. Speed Rack was more than just opening up a platform for women bartenders. All of the profits go to, be, to benefit breast cancer research. So it is one of the best causes our industry has. So you are supporting not just women bartenders, but the actual lives of women. If you are participating in and supporting Speed Rack, there's just no way that this doesn't actually benefit everyone we know. Advice to people looking to build their own table? Don't be afraid to ask for your need for help. This sounds simple, but it is absolutely one of the hardest things to do because marginalized people are taught not to ask for help. You're taught do it yourself. You're taught Pull you up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. But bootstraps don't help if you don't have boots. We are so taught to be self-sufficient and to not depend on anyone else that asking for help feels like a cop-out. Do not be afraid to ask for help where you need. Being vulnerable is your strength. Lynette is a goddamn goddess. And speaking of, you know, gods, this guy, Yannick is one of my best friends, but he's an incredible human being. Uh, again, his credentials are unassailable. Co-founder of Wheeling Forward, 
found the wheel on wine, wine on wheels, head sommelier university club, advanced quota sommeliers, advanced sommelier quota master sommeliers, two-time finalist top song, wine enthusiast top 40 in the 40, person of the year, new mobility magazine, coastal uncorked. And this does not tell the story. That guy is just one of the best humans I know. And I, I thank Maggie Campbell for introducing me to him. Shout out to Maggie Campbell. Yannick did the New York Marathon last year. Yannick spends, he's, he's literally one of the best sommeliers in the country. And Yannick devotes almost all of his time to making other people's lives better. Let's, let's get into him for a second. Yannick is disabled. As you see, he's in a wheelchair. He had an accident in his 20s, which deprived him of use of his legs. There were a lot of different ways she could have responded to this tragedy. He was fortunate enough to have the means to recover in the ways that one can recover from this, in that he was able to get rehab, he was able to count on his insurance, but he saw other people around him that did not have those advantages and were suffering because of it. He could have thought differently about his life at that point. He could have, a lot of people do. He looked at his good fortune as a reason and a means to go back and help people who did not have the resources he did. That became the reason for him to establish a foundation, Wine on Wheels, which actually makes sure that people who have a disability, who are struggling financially, can get the same kind of support and care and nurturing that he did. Obstacles overcome. It's To give you an example of the kind of obstacles you have to overcome when you're doing this, I first presented the Building Along a Table uh, seminar at Tales of the Cocktail in 2018, and Yannick was one of my panelists. We got to the venue, we were ready to go on stage, and they hadn't provided a ramp. I'm gonna say that again, I'm presenting a seminar on how you can include marginalized people and there wasn't a ramp for my presenter to get on stage. The venue spent 20 minutes scrambling to try to find a ramp for him. Eventually we had to pick up his wheelchair. Uh, and again, he was the coolest guy because that's just the way he is. He, he literally, pun intended, rolls with things. I was furious, a whole panel was furious. And again, I want to give a shout out to the panel because they're all deeply in the work. I was there with Yannick, Benjamin, Maggie Campbell, Ashton Berry. Shout out to everyone who's actually freaking doing that work. The obstacles, if you are a person who suffered a disability, are incredible because most people do not consider these things. Most people, when they're building their restaurants, don't consider, do I have a ramp? They don't consider, do my bathroom facilities accommodate someone who's in a wheelchair? They do not consider, are my tables 36 inches apart so somebody can actually have access and, and, and navigate my physical spaces? Insurance, it's, it's ridiculous how difficult insurance makes this for people who are disabled. Even if you're on private insurance, they can change this overnight for no reason. So there's a continual fight against this particular kind of injustice that is ongoing and it's a chimera, it's always changing. And Yannick is there making sure that other people who don't have the advantages he has have a chance to succeed as, as he succeeded. Growing the platform, we're gonna keep coming back to this. Growing the platform has always been about reaching out to your network. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your coworkers. A, a couple of years ago, I gave a seminar at ADI to a room full of distillers called Nobody Wants to Drink Your Shit. And I told 150 distillers, 
listen, you went through the process. You got a license. You sat with lawyers. You made a product. You sat with distillers. It's in the market. Congratulations. Nobody cares. We are not in the we are not we're not in the liquor business. We are in the relationship business. And if you do not have the ability to create and nurture and foment deep lasting relationships, you're not going to do well no matter what it is you're doing. The majority of the help that, that comes to wine on wheels and wheeling forward is again, as Lynette did, through word of mouth, through friends, through social media. Social media does not work if you are anti-social. And what I mean by that is, if all you do is talk about yourself, no one's gonna wanna talk to you. Up other people, show interest in other people. I, it sounds like a redundant thing that have to tell folks, but care about other folks where you want them to care about you. It's a good way, to, if it's a good way to live, it's a good way to do business, and that is a good way to live. Advice for people looking to build their own table. Yannick is talking about physical and emotional challenges, and it's hard to put this into, into perspective. You will never work as hard for someone else as you will for yourself, ever. You will work seven days a week. You will work 20 hours a day. You will go months, sometimes years, without a vacation. You have to have the passion that moves you forward. If what you're doing is only there to make money, it's not going to last. You have to have a commitment to something greater than yourself and your wallet in order to move forward and own something that is meaningful and lasting. You're going to have physical challenges. You're going to have emotional challenges. You have to have the mindset to move forward through all of these things and make sure that you can continue to maintain your sense of self until you get to the other side. I love this woman. Samara Rivers is another goddamn goddess. I mean, just everything about her just radiates. Samara is the founder of Black Bourbon Society, the co-host of Bur Bonded in Bourbon. Yeah, she's a mom. She does all this, and she's a mom. Props. So Black Bourbon Society, when we were planning our seminar last year, I think they had 4,000 members. Now I think they're close to 20,000, between 16 and 20,000. I don't know the exact number. Sam can correct me on this later. Sam saw that for all of the people, black people that drank and that drink liquor regularly, nothing was being marketed to sophisticated tastes. There was not just a, a lack of understanding, there was a lack of attempt to educate. So she created a company that it specifically helps liquor brands understand how to market to black people, how to come to us and not, and not treat us like we're idiots, how to avoid gigantic mistakes, the kind we've seen in advertising and marketing, how to make sure that we know which brands to appreciate and where to spend our dollars, because not just black lives matter, black dollars matter too. Obstacles to overcome, this again, this is something that we're going to keep coming back to. Marginalized people are taught that this isn't for them. Like, I know that I came from a generation where we were told, go to school, go to college, get an education, get a job. You can do that. I did that. I spent 25 years in corporate America, never got anything ahead. I spent 15 years on a director level, walked away with nothing. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to decide to step away from everything that you've been told you have to do in order to succeed and to succeed on your own. 
it takes years, not just to develop the conf, not just to develop your skill set and to develop your network, but to develop the confidence to use both. There's a lot of deep programming work to do. If you do not do the work in believing that you are meant to own things, that you are meant to, to benefit from your own culture the way other people have benefited from, cannot move forward in this. So commit to doing the work of decolonizing your minds and imagining what things would be like if you got to benefit from the culture that you created. How did you get to grow your platform? Again, we come back to this. They, they, none of these people had giant PR firms that they could spend 5,000 a month at. None of these people had giant family connections where they could just make broadcasts. None of them had money for this. This was all about being able to socialize, use your network of friends, use your network of allies, get in, embed yourself in the industry, and build your reputation. This is something that I cannot say enough for the people who are looking to build your own table. Build your reputation so that when it, when it comes time to build your own table, you'll be prepared. So we got three, I, okay, we got one more slide for this. Advice to give to people who are looking to build their own table, do it, build the table, invite who you want. This never take no for an answer is interesting. My best friend in the world is the daughter of a billionaire. And her saying is, never take no from someone who's not qualified to say yes. So if you're getting a no, you might not be asking the right person. There's a whole lot of people that can say no. There's usually only one or two people that can say yes. Find that person, have that conversation, and then don't take no. So, three icons of industry. Lynette, Yannick, Samara. If anyone see what they had in common based on our profiles of them? This is the very first thing. They all did something that didn't exist before. There wasn't a speed rack before. There wasn't a Black Bourbon Society before. There wasn't a wine on wheels before. They all identified a problem that nobody else saw. If you have an idea that you want to put out into the world, and it is not solving a problem for somebody else, you are creating a problem for somebody else. So before you decide to go out on your own, use your smarts, you're smart people identify a problem that no one else sees, figure out that problem. And when you do, you won't have to worry about people coming to you. The world will come to you. The whole world will come to you if you identify a problem. And all of those solutions are around us. We're on computers, we're on cell phones, we have Wi-Fi. We're on a freaking, we're on a freaking webinar. All of these are answers to solutions that no one knew we needed. Try living without your cell phone now. Try living without your computer now. Try living without Wi-Fi now. In the age of COVID, try living without webinars and Zoom meetings. So this is how we communicate. There's a problem out there with your name on it that no one has figured out yet. Figure out what that problem is. You can solve it. Here's the second thing that they all did. Embrace your passion. The, the, the list of things that these people could do individually is vast. They all chose to focus on something that had deep meaning for them as individuals. Lynette chose to help women because she saw that women needed help. She chose to focus on breast cancer research because she saw that this was something that was suffering. She chose something that actually had great meaning for her that she knew would be resonant. She could have done a lot of different things. She chose something that had great meaning for her. Yannick, same exact thing. Yannick 
is such a he's such a smart, talented individual. There are so many things that that man could do with his life. He took something that had meaning for him. He saw people hurting. He saw people in need. He saw people that did not have access to the same resources that he that he did. And he chose to create a platform that would actually let people move forward in his, in their lives the way he did. Sam, Sam and I have this in common. We, we both like to drink, but she didn't see ed, the education and the marketing dollars being spent on black people. This mattered to her. She picked her passion, and she figured out how to make a living out of it. I, I'm I'm the first person to say the liquor industry is famous for trying to figure out what the next trendy thing is going to be. The best way to predict the trend is to create it. And the best way to earn a living is to create a life. So figure what your passion is and then figure out how, how you can monetize that. Here's something else that's incredibly important. None of their, uh, none of their, none of their solutions focused on themselves. None of them. They're not front and center in any of these things. They all pick problems which made other people's lives better. Speed Rack makes life better for, for all of the women and really everyone in the hospitality industry. Wine on Wheels makes life better for disabled people and for people who are living with some, with some form of disability. Black Bourbon Society makes life better for black people who are trying to understand and learn how to drink better. There's a lot of valuable things that are going to help you succeed as you build your own table, but there's nothing more valuable than good will. If you're going to succeed, people have to want you to succeed. And if your big problem that you came up with the answer to only helps you, nobody cares. Again, you don't, I feel like this is something superfluous I have to say, but find a solution that shows that you care about other people. When you start by helping others, other people are going to be more inclined to help you. <clears throat> something else everyone had in common. This is a saying that Yannick says to me all the time, and it sticks with me and it's true. Start where you are, do what you can with what you have. Utilize your resources. No one else has your resources, and it doesn't have to be money. No one else knows the people that you know. No, no, no one else has your particular skill set. No one else has your vision. Figure out what your resources are. When COVID hit in March, and everything, all the restaurants started to shut down. I saw suddenly tens of thousands of friends out of work across the country. And I picked, I had Yannick saying in my head, start where you are, do what you can with what you have. Where was I stuck at home? What did I have? Wi-Fi and a bunch of unemployed friends. What do people need? What was the problem? People needed somewhere to hang out and they needed to put money in their pockets so they could eat. We started a virtual cocktail hour. We did six and 11 every single day. It's still going on. Uh, but we put tens of thousands of dollars in the pockets of bartenders. We had hundreds of sponsors. We've had everyone from Dave Wondrich to Dale DeGroff on the show to hang out. It was what we had. We had nothing but our intelligence, our network, and our Wi-Fi. So whether it, when you have your big idea, when you're focused on community and you know what you want to, you know how you want to move forward, start where you are with your resources. Maybe you've never written a business plan. Do you have a friend who has an MBA? Maybe you don't have a lawyer. Do you have a friend who, who, can, who can refer a lawyer to you? Maybe you don't have money to, for any of that stuff. Do you have Wi-Fi? Can you get on the internet and do, the, do your own research? 
human beings are your greatest resource at this point. Figure out who you know, who can actually really contribute to the knowledge that you do not have that you need to move forward and figure out how you are going to use that to turn your passion into some kind of reality, to turn it into your table. Which brings us to our next point, and this is probably the most important part of the whole thing. OPM and OPE. When I was 15, I read a book called Rhinoceros Success, which was an entrepreneur's book in the early 80s. And the guy's big pitch was, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be a charging rhino. You can't let anything stand in the way. But he gave a principle that I didn't hear anyone else say. You have to have OPE and OPM, other people's experience and other people's money. You've got your big idea, great. You're helping out the community, great. You know what your passion is, great. Why would anyone commit their resources to you? This is the single most valuable skill anyone who wants to own their own table can develop. We need to have the ability to convince other people to commit their time, their energy, their experience, their network, their checkbooks to your big idea. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going back to this. People have to want you to succeed. It, doesn't go, it does not pay to go through the world being a dick. Again, that feels superfluous, but we got to say it. If you can figure out the process of getting other people to commit their resources to your idea, somebody's gonna lend a hammer. Somebody's gonna lend you some wood. Somebody might lend you a hacksaw. Somebody might sit there and help you physically put the table together. You can build your own table. You don't have to do it by yourself. The best tables, all of the best tables, are a group effort. You might be the leader, but you're never alone. Pick your team, find your resources, figure out how to build your table. Again, your table, not someone else's, but that doesn't mean other people can't help. This is a particular favorite of mine. You gotta be unreasonable if you're gonna do this. Listen. We were not taught that we were supposed to have our own tables. We're still being told that, we're not, that we don't belong at these tables. It is an unreasonable thing to want to have your own table, despite the fact that you've got the knowledge, despite the fact that you built the infrastructure, despite the fact that you made the culture. It is still considered unreasonable to be rewarded with investor rates at the same at the same frequency as non-marginalized people. It is unreasonable to believe that banks would give you loans at the same rates as non-marginalized people. It is unreasonable to think that other people would care about your idea the way you care about it. You've got to be unreasonable about this. Me launching a liquor brand in 2012 with no money and no experience and no other black people doing this might be the most unreasonable thing I've ever done. It was also the smartest thing I've ever done. Reasonable people do not change the world and the world is desperately in need of change. Get your idea, get your passion. Consolidate your resources. Convince other people to help you build this table and do not stop until you have your own table built. It's a better world that we're trying to create. It's one that you can make that is equitable by design. It is one you can create that is sustainable by design is a table you can create that the world needs. So stop waiting, 
for somebody to invite you to sit down at a table where you are not welcome. Build your own table. Nice. Uh, I have to say, this is one of those times when you, I so wish there was an audience in front of you because uh, I think you, they'd be on their feet now uh, and not just applauding, but coming up and saying thank you and trying to connect with you because that's a, it's a powerful message. Uh, and I think it's one of proactivity as opposed to just there is a need to do this, but it's a nobody's going to necessarily hand it to you on a plate, but you summarized that really well. Jack, that's, that was awesome. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now, I know we've got one question, but if anybody else has any questions, now's the time to put it in the chat box. So, of course, we will post this tomorrow on YouTube, and YouTube allows people to put comments on. So I'm sure when people start to look through that, they'll see that. But I'm going to read this uh, question uh, verbatim. So I say, my name is Chris, and I'm a chef in New York City, and I've been working in the industry for over 15 years, including two and a half years on the diversity council of a major hospitality company. I've decided to go back to school to get my degree in industrial psychology and offer companies a real plan for what I call vertically integrated equality. What is step one for a company that already exists to change directions to an equality model? And that's from Chris. Uh, step one is them actually admitting that, that it's in, that it's that that it's unequal to begin with like that's the hardest part what we what we deal with is a culture that believes in the myth of meritocracy people really believe that if they don't know anybody for example who's a talented black chef that that is because there are no talented black chefs they don't take into consideration a that Circles of access are everything, everything. And if you don't have access, not just to money, but to people who can devote their time and their energy, who can open up their wallets and their uh, Rolodexes. What, what, it's not Rolodexes anymore, is it, is it? What, what do people use it for content books now, their phones? I presume so, yeah. People, if people can open it, their contacts to you. So, but the hard part is getting people to admit that's a problem just getting people to admit that it's systemically unequal is the hardest part because that means admitting fault and nobody wants to admit fault what you see most of all is when people are forced to look at how unequal things are they've got a choice between admitting wrong or doubling down and there's a whole lot of doubling down going on right now hmm. I do a lot of this training and diversity work, and it's always the hardest part just to help people understand the systemic inequality is generational. You get to be where you are, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anyone's life is easy, but you get to be where you are, not just because of what you do, but because of what everyone who came before you did. Uh, my both my my dad and my uncle fought in World War II. They weren't allowed to, or you know, they they volunteered to fight. They weren't allowed to fight because that was a time when this country still believes black black blacks lacked the courage to carry arms, or they thought that blacks were going to turn on on white soldiers who were also American. So they let my dad and my uncle uh, be musicians and perform for real soldiers. They got home after serving. God bless that they got home. Uh, and the president at the time, if they opened up all these social programs for vets, uh, loans for businesses and loans for homes and loans for education and deliberately excluded black people. There were whole towns that were built. They were like, we're gonna build whole, we're gonna build suburbs. No black people, period, end of story. Uh, so just getting people to admit that disclusion isn't a bug, it's a feature. That's the hardest part. If you okay. can get people to admit that, then you, then you, wanna, then you, then you got a good start. 
And I mean, I saw, obviously, you started off by showing the increased profitability for, you know, increased diversity. I mean, you talked about vulnerability as a strength. For so many people, it's incredibly difficult to, to, un, to admit that there is a problem. I mean, the idea of flipping it and showing to a corporation and a company the, you know, the increased profitability and things like that, is that like a way to convince people rather than necessarily getting them to admit that there is a problem, if you see what I mean? You think so, but no, because what I found out was that the way those tables are structured is not necessarily to increase profitability, but to make sure that they can retain power. Hmm. They're not designed to distribute power. And essentially, that, that's what it would come down to. It comes down to being willing to admit that other people can do as good or a better job than you do. And the folks who've been at that table for this long, they don't want to admit that. Despite the fact that you can show, especially in, in our industry, we started this. Mm. Alcohol culture, dive bar culture, distillation, even beer. Beer comes from Africa. We started this. We'd like to be able to do it on ourselves now, thank you. Okay, here's a, here's a big one for you. Building your own table could or should be considered to a political level, a black or a minority party, perhaps. It's a question from Bruno. Is it political? Do you think that building your own table should be or could be considered up to a political level? I mean, is there an idea that Republicans and Democrats don't, you know, that is a table that you aren't necessarily welcome at. Is is the question, is building the table a political act? Or is the question... No, I think, I think the question is, should it or could it be elevated to a political consideration? Like, should there be, you know, should uh, marginalized people form their own political party rather than necessarily trying to get a seat at a table, the political table? That is a very good question, and mm. I'll, I'll say that I think the answer is in stages. Uh, the idea of a black political party is good, except for the fact that blacks own a monolith. Like, there's no one right way to be black. Like, there's mm. no one right way to be a male or a human being. Mm. We have very different ideas on how things should how things should be governed and the only thing we mostly agree on is we need to have a bigger say in what goes on how that happens there's a tremendous diversity so my particular method of moving forward my preferred method and this isn't for everyone there is uh an ancient uh chinese companion to the art of war called the 36 stratagems of ancient China. And one of the stratagems is to replace beams with pillars. It means to take an existing structure and beam by beam, replace it until it is no longer the same thing. We got a pretty good look at what this could be like with, with, the, with, the, with the 2018 Congress. So many women, so many people of color, the first ever indigenous people, so many queer people. Like we could, in theory, take the existing structure and put enough of us into the structure where we're represented. Mm. Imagine the House of Representatives that represents us. It's a mm. possibility. And at least at the moment, it might be more viable than a, than a separate party that puts just black people at the table. I don't know what that looks like. But again, I'm the person that said being reasonable, so go for it. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just a shout out to, I think it's Elijah, uh, who runs a company, I think, not sure if he mistyped it, called Distilled and Chilled, who's starting his own business during COVID, bar merchandise and mobile cocktails as soon as he gets his manufacturer's license. Braced in Brooklyn, just wants to thank us for hosting the webinar. So thank you, Elijah, for that. Uh, Jackie, I think we're reaching the hour, and that tends to be, when, you know, people have other things to do at the top of the hour, etc. Thank you so much for this. Uh, as I say, I'm sure it'll provoke some comments. Uh, would love you to be able to check in on the YouTube page to see whether there are some conversations there. Uh, but 
that's all we have time for today. Thank you for attending today's webinar. And remember, we will be sending a recording of this to you tomorrow if you registered. If we didn't get a chance to ask you questions, make sure you follow up uh, on the YouTube channel. We'll be responding to it there. Thank you again. Thank you, Jackie, again, for sharing your wisdom. You've been me a lot of food for thought in trying to, as I say, continue to build the BCB table all around the world and always willing, you know, reaching out all the time for submissions. Would love to get more submissions from marginalized people uh, because, as I say, I can reach out, I use my network as I can. All right, let's do this. You heard this. Submit your, 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 your proposals to BCB so we can actually have these conversations on a big table. And the thing about digital is, as I say, it makes it so much easier to hear more voices and give people equal time, etc. So, as I say, please submit. Jackie Summers, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. For all you attended, I hope it was useful, interesting. And as I say, go out and build your own table. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Jackie. Cheers.